right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, thank you. At least I know that I have some people here. Um, I know that we just ate lunch, and lunch is good. And usually when you eat lunch, what happened? You doze off. So I hope that you don't do that today. Um, we are going to have our last session today for the revival and reformation of the church history. And um, I'm just waiting for everyone to come. So they're not moving. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how many of you so far have been blessed by the series since last night, even just this morning? Isn't it wonderful? Like to see the walks of people that have actually in the Reformation era that have actually stood firm for Christ. And you know what? There's one thing in common for them. If they shared it. That's one thing in common that's going over and over again in my mind that they shared that only to one person. So the challenge for us is we can only, we can just share that to one person. Can we do that? No, all of a sudden I hear crickets. Just one. Just to one person. And that's a challenge. But before I would uh, ask uh, Suki to come up here for the last time, I would like to ask if you can please bow down your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we once again want to come to you asking for your holy presence to be with us now. And Lord, we thank you so much for the history that history will teach us of what to look forward to in the future. And Lord, I pray that uh, as you challenge us today, that we take up that challenge of sharing our experiences that you, on how you have worked in our hearts to others as well, that others will have the same experience as we have. I pray that you please be with Suki, that you'll continue to speak through her, that what we hear today and what we learn today, we can apply it simply in our life. We ask that you please be with, sh shower us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I would like to invite uh, Suki to please come up front. Thank you. Watch your thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. No, you're right. Four hours a day for four days. Um, and then I'll be preaching once while I'm up there, and then we go back to Melbourne. Yeah. 
Cool. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So let's start. If you all have your Bibles, if you can turn with me to Revelation 12. So the entirety of this workshop, we will be going through Revelation 12. Now, Revelation 12 as a chapter really can be explored in a number of different ways. Okay. So Revelation 12 can be ex explored um, historically, prophetically, chiastically, episodically, right? Lots of different ways to go through it. I am not, I am going to touch on the prophetic bits, but I'm not really going to dig deep into prophecy today. I'm going to use Revelation 12 as a medium to look at the great controversy in church history. Because Revelation 12 is a great way to understand church history within the context of the great controversy. And whenever I teach church history, I like to do church history within the context of the great controversy. So if I was to ask you all, why do we need to study church history? What would you say? Why study church history? Right, that's a good answer to see how God has led us in the past. Yep. Any other any other reasons? Any other there's no there's no well, unless you're completely out there, there's no wrong answers. <laughs> right, yes. And, um, it, it follows God. Yes, right. To understand where we fit. Yep. Yep. Any other so those are all correct, all good. I don't understand how they solved all the Right. I don't understand how they solved all our pro their problems so we can understand it for ourselves. Yes, learning from the past. Very good. Yes, that is so true. See God's hand. Yes. Yep, that's right. Yeah, you see God's hand. That's right. That's right. But yeah. Cool. What I want to focus on with why we start, where we're studying, this is so, so tall. Uh, what I want to focus on with why we're studying church history is twofold. To understand our place and our purpose in the great controversy. Now, everything I'll share is true, but the focus of what I'm going to talk about is we, one, of the, one of the main reasons we study church history is to understand our place and our purpose in the great controversy. One of the significant contributions that the Seventh-day Adventist Church makes to the rest of Christianity is our understanding of the great controversy. Other churches don't understand the great controversy, but when you understand the great controversy, you understand the rest of the Bible, really, within its context. And so I want to look at Revelation 12, Revelation 12 is not written chronologically, okay? Revelation 12 is written chiastically. Now I'm hoping that there's like a, oh, there's a thing. Okay, so a chiasm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. A chiasm is a literary device that they use in Bible prophecy, in the Bible really, to kind of emphasize and draw attention to certain components. So this is the way Revelation 12 is built. Y'all can see, can you? Can everybody see? I'm left-handed, sorry. So, um, so Revelation 12, one to five is the woman and the dragon. That's where it starts, okay? And we'll read all of this, but I just wanna give you the big picture. Then point B is the woman in the wilderness. And you see this, in Revelation 12, verse 6, right? Then you reach your climax here, which is war in heaven. And war in heaven, that's Revelation 12, 7 to 12. 
Then you come back down here, actually 7 to 13. Then you come back here, and again you have the woman in the wilderness. That's Revelation 12, verse 14. And then you come back here. That's A again. Um, Revelation 12, 15 to 17. And you have the woman in the wilderness. Okay, so can you see this pattern? This episode mirrors this. This mirrors this. This has no mirror. Right? Right? And the reason it has no mirror is because it's the point. This is the whole point of the chapter, the great controversy. Because there is war in heaven, there are these encounters between the woman and the dragon throughout history. Okay? So the whole... Yes, that's right. That's right. And so because there was war in heaven, it spilled out onto the earth, and we see these, the great controversy continuing in the history of the church. Right? And so you have this... It begins here. This is the con context for this. The great controversy in heaven contextualizes the history of the church here on earth. Okay? So with that in mind, Revelation 12 can be divided into four episodes. I'm just going to leave that there. Revelation 12 can be divided into four episodes. Episode 1 is war in heaven. So this is chiastically. So what this does is this shows you the important point of this entire structure. This is the pyramid. This is the top of the pyramid. All of this is, you know, exists because of this, right? Now this is a chronological overview of it. So you've got war in heaven, then two is the woman and the dragon, the woman, the child, and the dragon, right? Then you've got three here, which is the woman in the wilderness. Right? And then you've got episode four here, which is the dragon and the remnant. So this is the chronology of it. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to go through this. Hopefully we'll have the time to do it. We'll probably do highlight reel for this bit, but we're going to go through this. And we're going to look at the great controversy in the history of the church within the context of the great controversy and what that means for us as Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. So can I have someone to read Revelation 12, 7 to 13? to 12 for me. Actually, just 7 to 9. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. We're just going to condense it. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. If, if I can get a volunteer to read that for me. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Thank you. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. Both prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast with him. Right. So you've got the woman and the, you've got the war in heaven. The two opposing forces are Michael and the dragon, right? And so I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to go into this prophetically. I'm just going to assume that everybody agrees that Michael is Jesus. And so <laughs> if, you've, uh, if, you've, if you've got questions about that, you can ask Evan. He's your church pastor, <laughs> right? So I'm not going to go into this prophetically. We're looking at this historically, okay? So you've got Jesus, who is Michael versus the dragon. The dragon is self-explanatory there. That's the devil. This is the, the crux of the great controversy, Jesus versus Satan in heaven, right? Now, was it an actual physical war? No. Well, we don't know that, <laughs> right? But definitely here, that's not, we're not given that information, right? What we are given, what we are told is it's a war. So what kind of war was it? Spiritual war, 
right? It was a war of ideologies, right? You had two opposing ideological frameworks battling it out in heaven, right? What were these two opposing ideological frameworks? And someone read Revelation, no, not Revelation, Isaiah 12, 14 to 12 for me. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. Sorry, I'm a little slow. I think it was the cake. <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most. Okay, can you see? So this is Satan, right? I will be like God. So when you look at these verses, Revelation, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, Satan's ideological framework is really clear. It's selfishness. It's the desire to exalt self. Satan wanted God's power, not his character. When he said, I will be like the Most High, he wasn't coveting the character of God. He was coveting God's power so that he could put himself above everybody else. So the first ideological framework that was you know, battling in heaven was basically self-idolatry. If I wanted to, because there's so many ways that you can put this, a hundred different ways. But it's this idea of selfishness, self-idolatry, self-exaltation, okay? So what was God's ideological framework? Philippians 2, 5 to 8. And I like these two passages because they really nicely juxtapose these ideas. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Can I get uh, a volunteer to read that? Y'all are going to be reading your Bibles out loud. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Philipp Philippians? Is that Philippians or Ephesians? That's Ephesians. So Philippians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. <laughs> Robbery to be with God made himself of no reputation. Um, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death. Right. So it's really interesting. When you put these passages next to each other, Satan was a created being who coveted the power of God. You see that, right? Satan was created and he was like, I will be like God. But when you look at Philippians 2 verse 5, you have God choosing to become a man so that he could die for us. Can you see, the, can you see how that's juxtaposed there? So you've got Satan is, I will exalt, and Jesus is, I will empty myself. And so they're antagonistic. They're completely opposed. Whereas Satan's is self-idolatry and self-exaltation, Jesus is self-sacrifice, self-sacrificing love. So now you've got two opposing ideological frameworks battling it out for supremacy. And of course, Satan's ideological framework, Satan and his ideological framework are cast out of heaven, right? And God, God retains his own ideology of self-sacrifice and of love. Because what is first John 4? What is first John 4 verse 8 say? God is love, right? God is love. And so you've got these two opposing frameworks, and it spills out onto the earth. How does it spill out onto this? It's really interesting. If you keep reading Revelation 12, it says that Satan was cast out to the earth. Why? Was that because we were some kind of toxic dumping ground? Oh, he's defective. Let's just chuck him here. No, right? Um, go to Genesis 3, 1 to 6. We're going to read Genesis 3, 1 to 6. Genesis 3, 1 to 6. If somebody can read that for me. Serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. 
field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Right. It's really cool. It's really interesting. So Satan comes to Eve, and of course, he insinuates doubt, right? He's like, oh, has God really said, right? And he brings in doubt, and then... With beginning with doubt, he brings in a complete lie. You shall not surely die, right? And it's really interesting because he says, you shall not surely die for God that know that in the day you eat thereof, you shall be like God. Can you? God, right? But this idea of the hum, human human beings becoming like God, right? In the God within, that, that idea, you will be like God, right? So what Eve fell for is the same thing that Satan himself was embracing. He was a created being. He wanted to be like God. He came to Eve and he told her, you will be like God. Not, God because, not God's character because God had already given Adam and Eve his character. Right? Genesis 1.27. He made them in the image of God. He was telling them, if you choose to disobey you will be empowered to be like God, okay? So as long as you're submitted to God, you are restricting yourselves. But if you choose to follow me, I will give you freedom to become equal to God. Gods, like a God, right? There isn't just one God in the universe. There's many gods. And let me let you unleash the God within. We hear so much of that in the world today, right? But can you see? So Eve is like, yup, eat the fruit, gives it to Adam, and they completely sell out to Satan's lies. So now the great controversy moves from heaven to the earth. Why? Because Adam and Eve have subscribed to Satan's ideological framework. Does that make sense? Right? So God's ideological framework is self-sacrificing love. And I'm going to do something really quickly. So God... But let me just first explain this and then I'm going to do this. So God's ideological framework is self-sacrificing love. Satan's is self-exaltation. Okay. Now, if you look very, um, so, I'm, so I'm condensing like hours of stuff here. So I'm going a little fast. But if you look at, for example, the purpose of God in the creation of man, you see this, right? God created us. Genesis 1.27 says God created us in his image, right? He created us to be like him. And first John 4 verse 8, I'm not going to get you to read this because I need to like, I'm just going to trust that you can write it down. If you've got questions, you can ask Evan. <laughs> first John 4 verse 8 says God is love. Romans 13, 9 to 10 tells us, Romans 13, 9 talks about the law, the Ten Commandments. And then it says love is the fulfillment of the law. So in other words, when God created us to be like him, he created us with the law in our hearts. Okay? But we all sinned and fell short of that glory. Right? Romans 3.23. Okay? And so, and this is where we're coming to the next part. So I'm going to pause here. But can you see that? So this is the cycle here. God created us to be like him in character. To have his law in our hearts. That is why the central focus of the great controversy is the law of God. If you read the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White talks about this again and again and again and again. The central focus of the great controversy. And it's really interesting. If, you've, if you read, um, I've been reading The Desire of Ages for my devotions. And I'm reading a chapter a day of Patriarchs and Prophets. And I've been reading The Desire of Great, great Controversy to do research. So kind of by... You know, by chance, I'm reading three of these Conflict of the Ages series books at the same time. And you know what I notice? 
continuously she talks about the great controversy, the focus of the, on the cross, and the importance of the connection, the correlation of the law to the gospel and the great controversy. It's really interesting. When, when you do it like a survey, you know, I'm sure you've, you've read the great, you've read the conflict of the ages and when you read it slowly, you get so much. But then when you're reading it, like you've got to read a chapter from here for research, you suddenly see this survey and you realize that the three things in the conflict of the ages series that over and over and again, she talks about is the theme of the great controversy, the centrality of the law and the gospel, and um, the correlation of the law and the gospel to the great controversy. And this is it. Because, and I'll show you in a minute. So the, the importance of the great controversy is the great controversy started it all. And the focal point of the great controversy is either selfishness or self-sacrificing love. Okay? And the definition of self-sacrificing love is encapsulated in the law. Because the Ten Commandments are what? Teaching you to love God and to love each other. Okay? The Sabbath commandment teaches you to accept God as your creator and to spend time with him. How do you nurture relationships, time and communication? That is why the Sabbath is so important. Honoring the Sabbath is central, so central to nurturing a relationship with God. It is your way of saying, not only is God my creator, he's my redeemer. Not only did he make me, he can recreate me. I am his and I choose to be loyal to him. It's the same thing with the commandment but about idolatry, about not taking God's name in vain. The last six commandments is about loving people. You can't love someone if you're lying to them. You can't love someone if you're killing them. You can't love your spouse if you're committing adultery. Love, right? So the, the framework, the ideological framework of God's character is encapsulated in the Ten Commandments. He made us with that in our hearts. But we chose, we chose Satan's ideology which is to say, you know what? I don't want to love God or other people. I just want to love myself. Do you understand? So Satan's ideological framework has love in it too. It's just, you just love yourself. <laughs> and that's the, I mean, if you look at the world today, you know that what I'm saying is true because the slogan for the world today is love yourself, right? We live in a world that is obsessed with itself, we live in a world that is obsessed with selfishness, that is driven by selfishness, that is driven by self-gratification. Instant gratification is the theme of this generation. All you have to do is look at the progression of social media over the years. They started with Facebook and now it's TikTok or Snapchat. I mean, Snapchat, I don't, I don't have a Snapchat or TikTok account, but what I understand from Snapchat is like, the, you, you have to put the thing in there and you've got a certain period of time and then it's gone forever. So you've got to like quickly look at it and then it's gone. What I'm trying to say is that you start with long form and now the attention span of most Gen Z, sorry for those of you who are Gen Z here, my children are Gen Zs too. It's like getting, like it's becoming like that of a goldfish. It's like they can't focus on anything that's longer than a, a 30 second sound bite. We are so obsessed with instant gratification, with self-gratification, with selfishness, right? And it is so difficult to bring in an alternative narrative. You know, as a parent, it's just like, sometimes I think there is nothing for my children to read or watch. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? There is nothing good. There is nothing edifying. There is everything in the world is about this. It's about how to put yourself forward, how to assert yourself, how to, be, how to get what you want, how to pursue your own goals. You, 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 you. But nothing in the world is about how can you love God more? And within the context of loving God more, how can you be a blessing to others? So you see, the this is the great controversy. You see the great controversy fought every day in the world, in your heart, in your home. The great controversy, the, the fight between selfishness and self sacrifice. Every day it's fought in our hearts. It's fought in the world around us. It's fought in our churches. It's fought in our homes. It's fought all over us because the great controversy is distilled into these two ideological frameworks, selfishness or self-sacrifice. Me, God, and others. Make sense? So this is where it's begun. And so God tells Satan, okay, this is your framework. And now you found, found an entire planet that has bought into it. Unfortunate. We volunteered ourselves as guinea pigs. 
find an entire planet that that's born into it. And so God gives Satan all this time, this, these 4,000 years here. I mean, of course, you've got, you know, God speaks through, through Abraham. You've got Noah. You've got all the great patriarchs. But the greatest narrative here is you see the unfolding of Satan's purposes, right? You see it as early as Adam, uh, as Abel and Cain, right? You see it in, the, in Noah's day. You see it through Lot. You see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see it in Babylon. You see Satan's ideological framework of war and blood and carnage and death. And then you come to episode two. Can somebody read Revelation 12, 1 to 5 for me? Revelation 12, 1 to 5. Man clothed with the sun and the moon under his feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being the child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third. Part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragons for the woman, which was ready to be delivered, or to devour the child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child, who was to rule all nations with the rod of arm, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Right. So you've got the woman, the dragon, and the child. We know who the dragon is, it's Satan. Jeremiah 6 verse 2 tells us a woman in Bible prophecy is a pure church, a church, a pure woman is a pure church. And if you read um, Revelation 19, 11 to 15, that tells you that the man child is Jesus. So you've got again this controversy between Satan, but now you've got a new entry into the controversy. Whereas before it was Satan and Jesus, now the people of God are in the middle, right? The church. So you've got Satan, the church, and Jesus. And you've got this great controversy between these three, uh, th three, three parties, these three players in the great controversy. And it's really interesting. We know that Revelation 12, 1 to 5 is talking about Jesus. And why, why is this so pivotal in the life of the church? It's because you've got the, the dragon trying to attack the, the man child or Jesus is really, it starts about earlier than 27 AD. It starts when Jesus was born, right? Herod trying to kill the innocents in Bethlehem. And then Satan's final act of deceptive cruelty was what? Killing Jesus on the cross. Here's the thing, right? You have, Satan has 4,000 years to reveal to the watching universe because this focal point of the great controversy is not just us, right? Over and over again, she says, it's the watching universe, right? We are made a spectacle to men and angels. So 4,000 years, the watching universe sees a plan of selfishness and self-exaltation unspooling, right? They see it in what happens with the flood. They see, it, they see it in what happens with Cain and Abel, with the flood, with Abraham, with Sodom and Gomorrah, with Lot. They see it with the Babylonian captivity, the restoration. They see it in the condition of the Jewish nation. And now God says, right, 4,000 years Satan has had to demonstrate his ideological framework. And now God is going to demonstrate his ideological framework to the watching universe. And that's the cross. Satan gets 4,000 years to show the world what his framework is like. And God says, I will show you what I am like on the cross. And here's the thing about the cross, right? If you go to Matthew, go with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. I need to find the exact verse. Matthew 26. And we will read. Matthew 26. Um, I'm going to pick, I'm going to read this. 
from verse 51. Matthew 26, verse 51. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck, his ser struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Now listen to this. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber and with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. Here's the thing, okay? Jesus is God, fully God and fully man. And in this moment, we know that it's Peter who draws the, draws the sword and cuts off Malchus's ear. And Jesus is saying to Peter, what are you doing with that sword? Don't you realize I can call 12 legions, that's 60,000 angels to come and rescue me now. What are you doing with that little sword, Peter? Okay, I can call 60,000 angels to come and get me out of this. I am not dying because I can't defend myself. I am dying because I am choosing to lay down my life for you. Do you understand that? Jesus didn't die because he was helpless. Jesus died because he chose to lay down his life for us. And when he died on that cross, the entire universe understood that Satan's accusations against God were false. He accused God of being selfish. But the cross demonstrated to the entire universe that God is self-sacrificing love because the God of the universe who could call 12 legions of angels to rescue him chose to be arrested and tried and nailed to a cross because, can somebody read Hebrews 12 verse 2? Hebrews 12 verse 2. Matthew 12, uh, sorry, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I love that verse, right? Jesus endured the cross. Why did Jesus endure the cross? For the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him that would make him the God of the universe allow himself to be nailed to a cross by the very creatures that he made? Think about that. You made these people. Their breath is in your hands. And yet you choose to lay down your life and allow yourself to be nailed to a cross by them and for them. Why? Because the joy of eternal fellowship with these very people <laughs> compelled you to do it. Can you imagine that? Like there's Peter denying Jesus. There's Judas just completely betraying him. There is that thief on the cross. And Jesus is like, you, I am going to die for you because I want the joy of eternity with you outweighs the agony of the cross. The entire great controversy was clarified on the cross because the entire universe knew in that moment, this is what the character of God is like. That this God, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, left heaven to die for these people. And not just randomly, not just, oh, I feel sorry for them, but the joy of the joy that was set before him, the joy of fellowshipping with me and with you led him to the cross. And that is the clarifying moment of the great controversy. The great controversy began in heaven and it was clarified at the cross. It was clarified at the cross. And that is why so many people say the cross is the fulcrum of the ages because the great controversy was clarified at the cross. The ideological frameworks clashed here and it was clarified here because the entire...
Satan murdering Jesus and Jesus willingly taking it because he wanted to see us in heaven. And in that moment, the entire universe saw the difference between Satan's ideology and God's ideology, clarified, right? And that's how the church was launched, 34 AD, right? Well, really, Jesus died in 31. And then, you know, I, why am I picking 34? It's not randomly out of nowhere. This is where the 70-week prophecy ends. If you study Daniel, right? So that's where the 70-week prophecy ends, right? And so you've got, because what you, what you re- need to realize is all the time prophecies that we as Adventists believe fit into the, this prophetic chronological order of Revelation 12, okay? So Daniel 2 fits in here. Uh, the 70-week prophecy, the 2300-day prophecy, the 1260-day prophecy, everything we believe, it just fits in here. And it is all related to the church. So Revelation 12 is really such a great chapter because it just opens up the whole thing. If you know it, if you know it all, if you've studied it, and then you unravel Revelation 12, and you've got a few hours, it's pretty cool. It's really cool. You can just see it all in there. Anyway, so this is now the church has, the church has started, and the church has one purpose. The church has one purpose. To make known the character of God to the world and to uplift the gospel so that people can be saved. Now, here's the thing, okay? The, chur- the church's purpose was to preach the gospel because now see, and this is really, again, where you bring that clarification. I wish I had... Yeah, I think I'm going to do it. But like, let me just not get ahead of myself. So, so here you see the great controversy, the great controversy on a personal level. This is the, the whole like chronological. Here's the personal level. So here's the thing. God made you in his image. You fell short of that image. And what does the cross do? Matthew 1, 21. What does the cross do? Matthew 1, 21 says, and, he sh- and, he shall call- and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin. Listen, you were made to be like God. Because of sin, you fell short of the image of God. Jesus' work is to restore you back to that same image. Can you see why the law is so central, why you can't chuck the law away? Because the purpose, because you're, you're, Jesus is saving you back to this. What is he saving you for? Or for, He's saving you from sin to what? To having the law of God written in your heart again, right? So the law is central to the gospel. This is what the church was supposed to preach. You were made to be like Jesus. Now you're all sinners. You need to repent and give your life to Jesus so he can restore you back to the image that you fell from. Clear and simple. The early church had all these components. Okay, so the early church had the law. They had an understanding of the gospel. You read, I mean, they wrote the Bible, right? <laughs> so you read Paul. He had a clear understanding of how salvation worked, of the law and the gospel. He had a clear understanding of salvation. Okay, so this is what, this is what the church was supposed to teach. And here's the thing. I don't have space. I'm just going to erase this. This is what the Jews were supposed to preach as well, but they just didn't get it. Now I'm going to draw. I can't draw very well. But imagine this is the sanctuary, okay? I want to show this to you. Now, you know, obviously, if I had more time, we could, like, really go into this, but we don't have time. So the sanctuary had the altar of burnt offering, the laver. Then here you had the table of showbread. You had the altar of incense. You had the candlesticks, right? And then here you had the ark. Pretend these are angels and the law in there. Okay, that's the sanctuary. We were created here. Right? Here. We were created in this most holy place experience with the law in our hearts. And then because of sin, we fell out here. And this is why um, Psalms 77.13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Thy way. What way? God's way of salvation. And so here, we are here. And this is, this is this bit. How do we come back to God through Jesus? You, this is justification. You accept the cross. This is baptism. And then this is spiritual growth. You read your Bible. You pray. You share your faith. And you grow and you grow and you grow till you are restored to the image of God. 
So the Jewish nation had the gospel in the sanctuary. The early church had the gospel. Make sense? And so you've got this great apostolic era. So the apostolic era is from here, from Jesus, to about AD 100. Some historians put the apostolic era, at, you know, end the apostolic era at AD 70. I don't see that, but some, some people do that. As you've got this, and of course this part you know here, though the Jewish nation had this, they were expecting what? A Messiah who would do what? A Messiah who would do this for them, right? A Messiah who would come and get rid of the Romans so they could rule the world. Instead, they got this. Some Messiah that came and died. They didn't want that. Can you say that? They were like, we, don't, we want this. We want the whole world to worship us. And you came and died on a cross. Like, what is that? Right? And so they were expecting this. They got this. And then Jesus' disciples also were expecting this, but they got this. And then after Pentecost, everything's clear. They got it. They understood the purpose of the gospel. Paul especially understood the purpose of the gospel. Understood that for the Jews, the temple was central. For Christians, Christ was central. For the Jews, heaven and earth in the temple. That is why the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem was such a big blow for them. It was like, we can't communicate with heaven anymore. But for the Christians, in Christ, heaven and earth come together. Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians is about that. Okay, so now you've got the church is going out and they are preaching and it is powerful. And Acts 17, right? They go to Thessalonica and what do the Thessalonians say? Those, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here as well. Okay, and if you look at the early church, why was their message so subversive? Because the early Greco-Roman world worshipped idols. And their gods, if you read, if you have any idea of Greek and Roman mythology, their gods were this, exactly this. The whole purpose of the, 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 the pantheon of Greco-Roman gods was to get these mortals to worship them, was to get these mortals to appease them. And here were these Jews, here were these crazy, this crazy Jewish sect. They had this Jewish Messiah. And, other, and they're teaching about self-sacrificing love. What is that? The other thing you have to understand is in the Greco-Roman world, everything you did was connected with paganism. If you sat down to eat, you would have to be offered to the idols. If you, everything you did, uh, for example, one thing that they used to do, um, and this is something that I learned when I was, you know, back during my theater days, Greek, Greek and Roman theater, okay, Always before they perform, so the theater was usually held in a public place. Everybody went to visit, went to watch. Before they perform, they would have the priestesses from the temple go and cleanse the city and invoke the spirits of the gods to come for this theatrical. So now, if you're a Christian, you're completely weird. You can't go and eat anywhere. You can't go for any, like you can't do anything because everything is connected to paganism. It wasn't like today where you can go to the supermarket and buy something and not wonder, has this been dedicated to Apollo? Do you understand what I mean? Chances are in that time it was. Okay. So it was really, so Christianity was strange. They were preaching this strange Messiah, but the biggest actor was the Greek and Roman world, especially during Paul's time, they all worshiped Caesar. The worship of Caesar was a, it was a cult, the worship of the emperor. And here's Paul coming and saying, there is another king, a higher king, Jesus. And Jesus has more authority over your life than Caesar. Oh, now not only are they weirdos, they're politically subversive weirdos. Okay, so what happens here from around AD 68, which is when Nero comes to the throne, Perse persecution. Okay, so Christians are persecuted. Persecuted left, right, and center from about 68 AD till about 313 AD. 
there are what is called the 10 persecutions of the Christian church under 10, uh, 10 specific um, Christian emperors. Now, there weren't only 10 emperors between 68 and 313. There were many, many more. But these 10 specifically targeted the church, beginning with Nero in 68 ending with a guy called Diocletian in 313. And in between, there was Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severus. You can Google it. It's, it's all there, right? I wish I could go into it, um, but I don't have time. So there's two things that are happening here between 68 and 313. The church is persecuted, and the vast majority of the persecuted church, it refines them. The church is growing. Tertullian wrote in his Apologia, the blood of the martyrs is seed, right? For every martyr that died, a hundred spring up in their place. Because people are like, whoa, look at these people's faith, right? Okay? But, that's the vast majority, but you also have reports, historical reports from this period of time, especially after about AD 100, in the first century AD, so from the 200s, the church is starting to slip. A part of the church is growing. Um, they're strong in their faith. But then a part of them are from about 280, you start to hear reports of the church, certain pockets of Christians no longer keeping the Sabbath. Certain pockets of Christians are just slipping. They don't want to keep the Sabbath. They don't want people to think they're Jews because the Romans hated the Jews and they hated Christians. And if you're if they perceived you as being a, a Jewish Christian, what it oh, it's just like a hundred times worse than being one or the other. So you're starting to see gradual signs of apostasy as early as the second century. In concrete, okay? So the focal point of this period, 68 to 313, is really persecution. The church is just slaughtered left, right, and center. But the persecution creates, there's sudden, there's a divergence with the persecution, okay? 313 AD is, of course, uh, 313, 312 is the conversion of Constantine. Okay, and um, the conversion of Constantine was really a turning point in the church because Constantine was getting ready to fight Maxentius. He was one of his uh, opponents. He was he was making a bid for the the imperial Roman throne, and then at the Battle of Milvan Bridge, he sees this cross, a Cairo, and he's told somebody a voice tells him by this sign, by this Cairo, conquer. And so he paints a Cairo on everybody, everything that moves in his army, the people, the anything, shields, whatever. And he marches them through the river Tiber and he's like, you're all baptized. And now we're, we're on our way to um, being Christian. <laughs> Yay! Because <laughs> he wins the Battle of Mil Milvan Bridge and now he's, he's the first Christian pagan ever, right? So the uh, conversion of Constantine is a turning point. Um, I'm going to move this because I need a bit more space here. <laughs> move this here. Uh, so from 313 to 538, right? Now you see now you see a more general open decline. Okay? So 513 Constantine comes on the throne 325. Actually, it was in 321, but 325 at the battle uh, the, not battle 325 the Council of Nicaea the Roman Catholic Church is created. Basically, 325. Roman means Roman. Catholic <laughs> means universal. They are the universal Roman church. They were kind of created. This was the first church council called by Constantine. Here's the thing where I was reading, I thought it was so cool. Constantine calls all the bishops to his palace. And among them is this one guy, this one bishop. During Diocletian's persecution, he had his eye put out for being Christian, right? Diocletian was the emperor. The emperor told him to recant, to worship the emperor or rec and recant Jesus. And he's like, I won't do it. And the emperor takes his eye out. And like 10, 15 years later, now he's sitting in the hall of the emperor, reclining on a couch, eating the emperor's delicacies. And all they're thinking is, well, thank the Lord, the persecution is behind us. Can you see the shift? It's really interesting, right? They went from being persecuted and hated to now being like just fettered, like just entertained by the emperor. They thought they'd reached the pinnacle of the world, but they hadn't. But from 325 AD, Constantine begins to control the church. And what happens is 
because he makes it a national pagan religion, it is more lucrative to be a Christian because now, whereas before pagans had perks, now Christians have perks. So you've got this stampede of pagans. They're like, I want to get baptized because I want a tax break. I want to get baptized because I want extra money in the, you know, to earn some extra money in the, the army. So you've got this whole horde of pagans coming into the church, half baptized. And Constantine is thinking, well, we need to meet these people halfway. Okay, so one of the earliest things he did, actually in 321 he did this, is the change of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was changed in 321, right? Earliest things he did because he's like, oh, we need to completely alienate ourselves from the Jews, right? Change of the Sabbath. Second thing he did after 325 is he brought in the worship of saints because if you know anything about Greco-Roman culture, they loved their gods. And I don't mean that they actually liked their gods, but they liked, they had so many gods. There was like a god for everything. If you, if you were dying and sick, you went to Asclepius. If you wanted to have children, you went to Hera. If you wanted, if you were going to war and you wanted good wind, you sacrificed to Apollo or Athena for wisdom or, you know, whoever, right? And then now you're telling us to get rid of Athena. Who are we going to pray for or pray to when we go for, to war? Oh, uh, here, here's, here's a saint. Let's just, just canonize one of these early Christians. Oh, look, now you've got somebody instead of Athena. And uh, what are we going to do if we want, if we lose something? We were always used to, go, used to going to this God. Oh, oh, look, there's, there's St. Anthony. And let's make up some legends. And now you've got a saint to pray to. Just replace them. Does that make sense? And so suddenly you've got all the pagan gods are gone, but all their functions remain. All their functions remain. There's just new, they're not gods, they're saints. And we're all happy. The Christians were happy because here was the, pray, the Roman emperor venerating their early Christian martyrs. That's great, right? They were killing them before, now they're canonizing them. And the pagans are like, oh, this is great. Because you're trying to understand this, right? The Greeks are the ones that had this pantheon of God. So the Greeks called her, Hera. And then when the Romans took over, then she was called Juno. And now in the papal, then the papacy takes over, she has a new name. Do you understand? They're used to this shape shifting. They're used to Hera becoming Juno, becoming something else. They're like, oh, great. So we're all happy. So these are the things that started to come in around this time. You've got a change of the Sabbath, the worship of saints, the gradual rise of the Bishop of Rome. The what happened, you see a shift in the church in this period here. What happened here in this period, especially after the, emperor, uh, the apostles died, is the church gradually began to depend more and more on their bishops. Till the, about the early part of the first century, the, the, the 100s, you know, middle part of the 100s, early part of the 100s, suddenly you have a shift in correspondence where the church is no longer talking about being presby Presbyterian. Presbyterian means no longer talking about elders, you know, having elders and having a congregation. Suddenly there's bishops. And the bishops are not like the elders. The bishops are really powerful and really controlling. Right? So you've got this happening here, but it wasn't until here that Constantine really empowers these bishops. Like gives them not just ecclesiastical, but political power as well. So you've got this shift now. And then by 538, the Bishop of Rome had emerged as supreme head of the church, right? Supreme head of the church. We, we call 538 to 1798 uh, is 1,260 years. Okay, so that's the woman in the wilderness. Can somebody read Revelation 12, verse 6, 14? Do you all need a break? No, you're good? Okay, cool. Just checking because there's a, still a ways to go. Um, uh, Revelation 12, 6 and 14. And the woman fled to the wilderness where she had a place prepared for the nation, 10,200 and three score days. Verse 14. And, and the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place 
where she is nourished for a time and time and half a time from the face Right. So this period, 1260 days, more even than the 2300 day prophecy is repeated over and over and over and over and over again. Daniel Revelation. It's really cool. It connects the books of Daniel Revelation. You have it mentioned uh, several times in the book of Daniel. You've got it mentioned several times in the book of Revelation. Over and over again, 1260 year period is very important. The 1260 years can be divided into two sections. So 538 to 1348 is the first section, and then this is the second section. You'll understand why I divided that in a minute. 538 to 1348, you have a further decline of the church by the Pope introducing a great, the Bishop of Rome that becomes Pope, and he introduces a great number of fallacies. There are a lot, I'm just going to point out the most obvious ones, okay? So you've got, so during this period of time, you've got the change of Sabbath worship of saints, rise of the Bishop of Rome, okay? Then he brings in, now he's bringing a ton of other stuff, okay? So he brings in transubstantiation, uh, which is basically transubstantiation is when they, um, when they basically said hoc es corpus meum over a piece of bread and it becomes a God, becomes God, becomes Jesus. And then you're sacrificing. And then the priest becomes the priest who is sacrificing Jesus on the altar. They literally believed it was the bread, right? And then the blood uh, is the, 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 the wine is the blood of Jesus. So it's transubstantiation. The other thing they, um, they brought in is this idea of, right, yeah. They believe that they could create God. Yeah, basically. Um, then you've got here the relics, uh, indulgences, and penance. So this started during the Crusades. So what the Pope did during the Crusades, Innocent III, that was his name, Innocent III, um, he basically needed people to fight his wars. And so he said, okay, if you come and fight for a period of 40 days, I will forgive all your sins, past, present, and future. Meaning, even if you like, you're on the way, you have this thing in your hand and you're on the way, and you uh, actually, I'll save this story for Martin Luther, but basically, you get the idea, right? Relics, ind relics, indulgences, penances, they brought that into this idea of suddenly there's a tooth that belonged to some saint, and let's go and worship it because there's miracles around that tooth. And oh, look, we have discovered a splinter from Noah's ark. This is true. They actually, uh, during Martin Luther's time, you know, at the Castle Church of Wittenberg, they had a splinter from Noah's Ark, right? And they put them in these things called reliquaries and they worship them. But the thing with this is the church was broken. They needed money. So you've got to pay. The other thing, now this is, a, now this is tricky. Again, about this period here, you had some of the church, church fathers I use that word, that term very loosely. Men like Origen and Ambrose, they were men that were really into Roman and Greek philosophy, but they were Christians. And they set up schools in Alexandria. And during this period here, there came a shift towards what is known as um, Platonist anthropological dualism. So Plato believed that people are two parts. Anthropos is man. Dualism means two. You're a body and a soul. Though the body can be corrupt, the soul can be cleansed and then go off to fly and become part of heaven. So anthropological dualism was Platonist and it started to creep into the church from here during this time of persecution. And then it kind of gained momentum, gained momentum, and it was cemented here, the immortality of but it crept in over a period. One thing you have to realize is error and heresy doesn't come overnight. It creeps in over a period of years. Okay, so, so they, this idea of an immortal soul. Okay, comes in. Uh, it's Platonist anthropological dualism. And you, you see it in the church. He brings it in. And the two of the things that come in as a result of this is purgatory and hell. The church invented an eternally burning hell for its own purposes. You know why? Because here you are and your loved one is now, because nobody, regular people like us didn't go to heaven. 
Only saints went to heaven. Okay, so if you canonize someone, you know they were in heaven. But people like us, you either go to purgatory or hell. And you know what? Do you want a be burning in purgatory? No, you don't. So you need to go visit some relic and pay some money and we will shave a few thousand years off of that. That's how it is. Okay? So these are the things. That, and then you it brought in the seven sacraments. So one of the worst, worst eras uh, that the church brought, I mean, all of this, are bad, all of this is bad, right? Um, but one of the worst things they brought in is this idea that they believe that you're saved by grace. But here's the thing. Grace is like the church is the repository of God's grace. In other words, all of God's grace. Think of the church as a really big silo. And all of God's grace is in this silo. And if you want access to it, there are seven little spouts or spigots around this silo, the seven sacraments. Do you want some grace? Well, you better baptize your child as soon as they're born. Do you want some grace? You've got to marry in the church. Do you want more grace? You've got to do penance. So the seven sacraments, honestly, I don't know them off the top of my head, but I know extreme unction at death, baptism, marriage, uh, clerical, uh, the taking on uh, the clerical vows. Um, so each of the sacraments dispensed grace. The sacrament that was most readily available to everybody was mass. That's why people went to mass three times a day. Okay? Uh, because um, famously, Henry VIII went to mass three times a day. Um, in Hampton Court Palace, which is one of his favorite palaces, there's his chapel, and the priest would be saying mass there in front. Henry would be here sitting at the back signing his his, you know, he'd have all his papers. He's signing while the priest is doing mass. And all he had to do was just look up when the priest lifted the host and done, tick, got my grace for the day. <laughs> Keep signing his important documents <laughs> three times a day. Do you understand? They, they, basically, what the church did during this period of time is they turned relationship with Jesus into a ritual. Do you understand that? So here... Jesus is all about relationship because, you know, loving God and loving others is relational, right? So cultivating a relationship with God, cultivating a relationship with Jesus is where salvation comes from. The church took away a relationship and they turned it into a ritual. So if you don't have a relationship with God, you can't grow, you can't change, right? So now this is all this. The church is completely like just in darkness. That's why this period especially is called the Dark Ages. There was very little progress in terms of art or culture or literature during this period of time. People were largely illiterate. Um, they were largely with large rural populations. And also the Bible was taken away. So the other thing, and I don't have space, is they confiscated the Bible. So people couldn't read the Bible. It was in Latin. It's translated by a, a guy named Jerome. If you were here for my sermon, you know that Jerome just did a really bad job with the translation. So this is us now, Dark Ages. 1348 is a turning point. 1348 is a turning point in just secular history. It's a turning point in church history. Now, what happened in 1348? 1346 um, was, um, and I like to tell this story, but I have to tell it. So 1346, there was this little trading post on the shores of the Black Sea called Kaffa, okay? And Kaffa was a Genoese trading port. Italy at that time was not a single country. It was a, a collection of city-states. And Genoa was a city-state. And Genoa and the Mongolian horde, uh, the Mongols in the northeast there, they had a trade agreement where Genoa had leased Kaffa and they were trading. And then the Genoese, you know, ticked off the Mongols, didn't take much to tick them off. And the Mongols are like, we're going to teach these Italians a lesson. So they come down from the steps and they besiege Kaffa and they're ready to just destroy the Genoese, take back their trading posts, blah, blah. And then suddenly they start getting sick. These massive black lumps all over their body and then they hemorrhage internally and then they're like dropping dead like flies. And the siege is about like the Genoese are on the brink of like surrendering. But then the Mongols are dying left, right, and center. And they're like, what is this? And the Mongols are like, we're not going to go down without a fight. So they have these massive catapults they were using to lob things like over the wall. 
they put the dead bodies of their soldiers in the catapults and put them over the walls. It's the first recorded instance of biological warfare in history. And so bodies land everywhere, and so the water source is contaminated, there's bodies rotting in the, 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 the street, and the Genoese are dying. And a boat, like a few of these Genoese guy merchants hop in a boat and they get on the Black Sea and they manage to make it to Constantinople. They get to Constantinople and they fall sick, same symptoms, black bubules, and they're dying. It's the Black Plague. And the plague spreads like wildfire across Europe. By 1348, it comes to England. It comes to Oxford. It actually reached the shores of, you know, the, the south of England in about 1347. Within an 18-month period, 40% of the population of England is dead. Think corona on steroids with no public health and safety. Like, just everybody's dying. 40%. Like, it crippled the unicorn. The estimates are that, you know, some chroniclers during the time wrote only 10% of the world is alive. They felt like that, that 90% of the people in the world had died. It wasn't that bad. About 60% of the population of Europe died. So it cripples Europe, 40%. Why is 1348 significant? Because 1348, it gets to Oxford, and there is this young man at Oxford, 24 years old. His name is John Wycliffe. And he's studying at Oxford and he's seeing all these people dying, like they were dying so fast, the bodies are piling up, they can't bury them. And they believe in what the church teaches, right? You can't, you have to bury them on sacred ground, you have to say extreme unction, others are all going to hell. People are panicking, right? Everybody's going to hell because you can't get the priest to come and pray over like all these dead bodies, just nuts. Wycliffe had been at Oxford for a while. He'd been studying the Bible. But it was all intellectual. Suddenly, when all these people are dying, Wycliffe is asking himself existential questions. Why am I here? Where am I going after I die? And he reads the book of Romans and he discovers Jesus. And he realizes the church is not. There was this axiom in the church, nulla salus extra ecclesia. Outside of the church, there's no salvation. And Wycliffe discovered Nala salus extra Christus. There is no salvation outside of Christ. Changed his life. And suddenly, 1348, Wycliffe goes out and he's preaching. And the more he studies, the more he's like, the sacraments are nonsense. Relics are nonsense. Transubstantiation is nonsense. The Bishop of Rome is nonsense. Can you see? He's just breaking it all down because he's studying the Bible. He translates the Bible. He begins translation on the Bible. His followers finish it. He makes such waves that by 1401, here, 1401, that's a significant date. 1401, two things happen in England. The British Parliament passes its first heresy laws in the history of the country. And that same year, William Sawtree is burned. He stuffed into a barrel and burned at Smithfield, the first Protestant martyr of the Reformation, William Sawtree. And um, it's bad, right? And then Wycliffe's teachings in 1384, Wycliffe died in around then, but just before Wycliffe died, Queen Anne of Bohemia, she was the Queen of England, she died. And she was a follower of Wycliffe. And in her among her personal effects were Wycliffe's writings. When her ladies-in-waiting went back to Bohemia, they took Wycliffe's writings and one of his Bibles back to Bohemia. And soon Wycliffe's writings were circulating in Bohemia. And around the eight, early 1400s, around 1410, a young man named John Huss. He was uh, in Prague the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague, he was preaching. He had started preaching from the Bible, Huss, right? He was, Huss was like teaching from the gospels in the Bethlehem Chapel. And there were like these tons of people coming to listen to him every Sunday because he's just preaching from the gospel. But he had, hadn't heard of Wycliffe, right? He's preaching from the gospel. And then one day, you read this in the Great Controversy, he, one day he goes out into the square in, in Prague there and he sees these two young men drawing. And these guys are from Oxford. Wycliffe's followers, and they're drawing these two paintings. One is the Pope in all his glory, and the other is Jesus. And you see the contrast. And then 
Haas sees this and he's now starting to question the legitimacy of the church. And then he's heard about Wycliffe, but he'd never wanted to read Wycliffe's because he's heard Wycliffe was a heretic. He goes back and he picks up Wycliffe's books, which have been brought and distributed through Anne of Bohemia, through lots of people. And he reads it and he's like, this guy has the truth. And now not only, not only is he like embracing the Bible, he's now questioning transubstantiation. He's questioning the sacraments. Suddenly there's this movement around this guy called John Huss and they can't shut him up. So they tell him to come to Constance, the Council of Constance in 1415. And the emperor tells him, I will give you a safe conduct. A safe conduct is a guarantee of protection from, when, from door to door. Okay, so a guarantee of protection. You leave, you come for the council and you're delivered safely home. Guaranteed. That's what a safe conduct is. After you get home, all bets are off. Right? But a safe conduct is a guarantee of protection from door to door. But when he goes, Huss foolishly goes to the Council of Constance, the moment he gets into Constance, he's arrested. Sigismund, the um, emperor, goes back on his word. He imprisons Huss and Huss is burned. And Huss's friend Jerome is also burned. And what happens? that point are what are called the Hussite wars because the church wants the, the Hussites, Huss's followers, because through Huss, when they killed Huss, Bohemia was ignited. They were like, they did what? Because people liked Huss. Huss was, you know, follow the connection. So Anne of Bohemia was a follower of Wycliffe. Brother was king of Bohemia. Wycliffe was, Anne of, was the brother's chaplain. So the king of Bohemia was influenced by Wycliffe on two sides. M most of Bohemia was, was, was embracing Huss. They were against the church. And so the church says, you need to submit. And they come and they fight. So there's these wars. And the Hussites refuse to submit, refuse to submit. They're winning over and over again. And the church says, fine, okay, we give up. But let's get along. Let's be friends. And they sign a compact. And in that compact, the church basically agrees to compromise so they can have peace. It's really interesting if you read the compact. So that is the, the precursor. We haven't read the Reformation yet. It's the precursor of the Reformation. And then from about 1450. Now, the other thing you need to, to realize is really cool. Are you all tired? You all good? Okay. The other thing you need to realize is from around, the, so 1348 is the rise of the morning star. Rahas is known as the morning star of the Reformation. Around, oh, uh, you know, any time between here, there are conflicting reports. But around this period, say 1370, okay? And I'll share this story with you. In 1370, in Florence, so I told you, right, Italy was a conglomeration of different city-states. Florence was very powerful. A lot of education in there. They were ruled by the Medicis, a lot of money, a lot of banking in Florence. It's a lot of money. Milan comes to besiege Florence. because, Of course, everybody wants Florence for many, many reasons. And the uh, dictator of Milan was a guy called Gian, Gal Gian Visconti. Gian Visconti is like, right, going to bring these Florentines to their knees. He's besieged them. He's ready to bring them down. The, the Florentines are like, oh, we're going to be like captured by the Milanese. And the Milanese start getting sick. The plague. And they're dying. But the Milanese are not nearly as ruthless or as inventive as the Mongols. So nobody gets catapulted anywhere. They just die. And the Florentines like open their gates and they see the Milanese dead and they're like, we've been saved, right? But now, how do we make sure that when this happens again, we are prepared to deal with ISIS? So what do they do? They decide to, to, decide to go ad fontes to the sources. And they go back to the old Greek and Roman sources because they decide we need to improve ourselves. We need to culture ourselves. We need mental and just mental culture. And they go back to the old Greek and Roman philosophers. And that is what is known as the birth of humanism and the birth of the Renaissance. So you, this period is, the, see, this entire period was the Dark Ages because there was no Bible, right? The Bible only was introduced from about 1517, right? This period, it was really the Dark Ages because there was very little growth. Yes, there were cathedrals built, but there was very little growth. But from here, suddenly you have the Renaissance. So you've got art, you've got culture, right? But here's the thing. When Wycliffe comes back, and how does Wycliffe deal with the crisis? He goes back to the Bible. 
How did the Florentines deal with the crisis? They go to the wisdom of the world. It's like Daniel chapter two, right? When Nebuchadnezzar was faced with a crisis, what did he do? He called in his wise men. When Daniel was faced with a crisis, what did he do? He went on his knees. So you've got now these two movements. The, the Florentine Renaissance, the rise of humanism here is really the precursor later to the age of enlightenment, Voltaire, Descartes, what we know today as postmodern atheism. It started here, right? And so you've got these two movements. You remember, right? Um, for every, every time God brings something true, Satan brings a counterfeit. So the Renaissance was really the counterfeit. And you've got humanism growing up alongside the Reformation. So sometimes when you read about the Reformation, you hear a lot about humanism because some of these early reformers were humanist, humanist but not exactly in this way because... So you had secular humanism, and then you had another thing called northern humanism because you had people like Erasmus. Now, before you get too excited about Erasmus, yes, he translated an amazing Bible. His, our King James Version, Tyndale's Bible, comes from Erasmus' translation. King, King James Version of the Bible comes from Erasmus. Did a great job. But Martin Luther famously said, Erasmus is an eel. What does that mean? You could never pin him down. He was so slippery. He didn't know what he believed, Right? But the thing with Erasmus is he, he raised up this movement called Northern Humanism where he's like, well, all of these people are going ad fontes. They're going to the sources. We should go back to the sources as well. And what is the source? The Bible. So he go, goes back. He, he translates this amazing copy, the Novum Instrumentum of the Bible. He's like, we need to bring about apostolic regeneration to the church. It was cool. So this is another, another movement. You've got a few movements, right? So that's all happening here. And, um, and then Gutenberg and his press, right? So now things are marching on. And then in about 1510, in um, France, this guy called Jacques Lefebvre decides that he wants to write a book about the saints. Jacques Lefebvre is the chair of theology at the University of Paris. And at that time, the University of Paris was the university to be at. And the name of the faculty of theology was the Sorbonne. And so Jacques Lefer is the, the head of the Sorbonne, massive high position to have. Okay. And um, he starts translating this and he goes to the Bible because he's like, well, Paul was a saint. Need to write about him. Need to go to the Bible. He reads the Bible and he's like, wait, what? He reads Romans and he's like, justification by faith. You don't need the church. And remember, he was head of theology. So now he is teaching righteousness by faith to all these guys. These young guys are sitting in the pew and they're just lapping it up. And one of these young guys was a guy by the name of William Farrell. Farrell was deeply Catholic. And he was now looking at Lefebvre and thinking, what on earth are you preaching? The church is the, 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 the authority. And, and Lefebvre is like, no, the Bible is the authority. And Pharrell is like, I can't accept this. And so he wrestles and wrestles, then he accepts it. And then Pharrell is so fiery. He's like now going out on street corners, preaching about Jesus. Okay, and then there's this other guy, Pierre Oliverton. Pierre Oliverton has a cousin. And when Pierre's cousin, John Calvin, comes to study at the, at the Sorbonne, he's like, John, you, you have got to come with me and listen to this preaching. Like, like Lefebvre's off. And by now, that Lefebvre had left and there was a bit of a dispersion. There's a lot of this story, but I'm just trying to cut it short. And so Calvin is like, you're crazy. The church, it's the church. Calvin was brilliant and he was going to be the poster boy for, for the Catholic church. And Pierre Oliverton is like, no, it's Jesus. And they have this really cool conversation in which Oliverton says to, pa to Pierre, uh, to Calvin, you know what? There are two there are only two kinds of religion in the world. One is that teaches man that they can be saved by their own works. And the other is the truth that teaches people that they can only be saved through Jesus. You are in error. And Calvin's like, you're crazy. And so Calvin's wrestling with this. And then as the story goes, one day Calvin is walking in Paris and he goes to this place called the Place de la Greve, which is where they killed heretics. And there was this guy and he was burning. And in those days, people didn't have TV. So where did they go for entertainment? Wherever somebody was being burned. So here they are. In England, they sold the equivalent of popcorn too. Like they had a program and they sold like snacks for you to enjoy yourself while somebody was burning. They did that in England. 
crazy. I don't know whether they did that in France, but here they are, they're watching this guy burn. And Calvin's walking past and he stops and he, he's struck by how peaceful this guy looks. He looks about his own age and he's like, how is he dying like that? I don't have that peace. I have no assurance that if I die, I have no assurance that, that I'm not going to go to hell. This guy's dying like he has the assurance that he's going to be in heaven tomorrow. What is this? So he goes back and he studies his Bible because now he's hearing his cousin's vo voice in his head because he's like, this is Harry. This is one of Pierre's friends burning. He goes back and he studies the Bible and Calvin is converted. And Calvin becomes a Bible worker. He literally goes through Paris, knocking on doors, sharing the Bible with people. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So you've got Lefebvre, and this is the early 1510s. And Lefebvre and this group of guys, they go to this place called Meaux, and they plant the first Protestant congregation in the city of Meaux in France before Luther. A couple of years later, we all, all know the story about Luther, right? He's struggling, and then there's Johann von Staupitz that comes and teaches him, and then Luther has his epiphany through the Book of Romans. Incidentally, in 1516, when Erasmus's translation of the Bible comes out, Luther studies Romans from Erasmus's translation. The real, <laughs> the tipping point for Luther came, and not a lot of people know about this. So what happened is, there was this guy called Albrecht, Albert of Brandenburg. He was the spare. You know, his brother was there, he was the spare. And he was, in those days, if you're the heir, get the whatever, the the, the heir, the, palace, the kingdom, that's you. If you're the spare, you either go into the military or actually you just went into the church. So this dude was the spare. He was the bishop of Magdeburg. Now, the way the German empire worked is, again, Germany wasn't a single country. It was a, it was a conglomeration of different duchies and principalities. Some territories had more power than the others. For example, electoral Saxony was more powerful because you have a vote to elect the emperor. Okay, so not all territories could elect an emperor. Ducal Saxony couldn't. Magdeburg couldn't. But if you were the bishop of a place called Mainz, you had a vote, which meant you could become a political power broker. So Albert is like, I want to be bishop of Mainz. But church law says you can't be bishop of two places. But the church loophole says if you can pay the right amount of money, you can be anything you want to be. So he goes to Leo X, the Pope, and he tells him, now Leo is a Medici, right? Medici's like to live it up. Leo comes in here, and one of the first things he says as Pope is, let us enjoy ourselves, for God has given us the papacy, right? He didn't even really believe in God. So he comes in there, and Albert comes to him, and he's like, hey, I would really like to be Bishop of Mainz. And Leo is like, I would really like to beautify Rome. How much have you got? And Albert is like, I'm actually broke. And because he was. And the Pope's like, right, 36,000 ducats. Ducats were the currency of Venice. So the, like, the, the value was higher. Huh? 36,000 ducats, a lot, a lot of money, millions of dollars. He's like, okay, I can, you know what? I got a friend. His name is, um, oh my goodness, I've forgotten his name, Tetzel, Johann Tetzel. We can get Tetzel to go out selling indulgences. And then whatever he earns from the indulgences, I will use that. He will go through Germany. 36,000, I'll pay you. That's for my, the seat. And whatever's left is for you. It's a win situation. The Pope's like, okay. So they sent out Tetzel. And Tetzel going out peddling indulgences. And then he comes to this little town called Jutebog because Frederick of Saxony refused to let Star, uh, Tetzel come into his territory. So Tetzel sells his indulgences right on the border there. And on good on Easter Sunday, Uteburg, he comes in and he's like, good people of Uteburg, I have come here to sell you this indulgence. And here's the thing. You buy this indulgence and you walk out and you can kill somebody on the road and you will still go to heaven because this indulgence guarantees you forgiveness for past, present, and future and any kind of sin. So these people are like rushing there. And there was a price list. I kid you not, there was a price list. So if you were a noble, you have to pay 20. If you were like, you know, just different denominations of depending on your station in life, because some, some people can afford to contribute more, right? <laughs> so they're like paying this dude. And two of the people here were people from Martin Luther's congregation. They go back home and they go into the confessional and they're like, Dr. Luther, we don't have to come and confess our sins anymore. 
And Luther's like, what? Because Luther is all like now working for his salvation, but he's also learning about justification by faith. So he's going through his own personal people. And they're like, yeah, we bought this. We bought this indulgence. And it tells us that we can even kill somebody and we're still going to go to heaven. And Luther just loses it. Because he's like, what? Because he, he believes in like, you don't understand justification by faith as the reformers understood it was not just forgiveness of past sins. It was the power of the Holy Spirit in the life to renew it and give people the power to live new lives. They believed in both, right? So he's like, not just forgiveness of sin. Jesus is supposed to change your heart. That is what triggered him to write the 95 Theses. If you read the 95 Theses, one of the things he talks about is renewal of the heart. And then he decides to make the biggest impact. He goes, why October 31st? Because October 31st was All Saints Day, All Saints Eve. And the Castle Church of Wittenberg, where Elector Frederick, Prince Frederick, lived next door. That was his personal chapel. There were 5,000 relics in that church. And on All Saints Day, the Elector of Saxony opened up the church. And if you came and you bought his special indulgence, you would, you would have X many years off purgatory. Now, his indulgence wasn't as strong as Tetzel's, but it was strong. So you had all these people from all over Germany coming here on All Saints Day because he had a shred of Noah's Ark and a thorn from Jesus', Jesus uh, crown and some milk from Mary's own breast. He had all of that in little reliquaries. <laughs> so people will come. And so Luther comes in and he nails his 95 theses onto the castle door when the people are in there. You know, I wonder sometimes when you think about Luther nailing it, you think there's nobody around and there's this hollow hammering. No, he was packed with people. He had to work through the crowd to nail it and everybody read, reads it. And then somebody takes it off and goes and prints it. And it goes everywhere. And the Reformation began with Luther because Luther was the first one to publicly challenge the church like that. And then, of course, it spread far and wide. And um, from Luther, you've got Calvin, you've got all, you know, the, and the Reformation just, just explodes. There. Now, the Reformation restored quite a few doctrines, part of the bit of the truth. They restored the Bible. Uh, they denounced the worship of saints. They denounced the authority of the Pope. They denounced transubstantiation. They denounced relics and indulgences. Did you also know that Martin Luther and John, uh, uh, William Tyndale believed in soul sleep? So they didn't believe in the immortality of the soul. They believed in soul sleep. So why is it that the majority of the Protestant world today believes in soul sleep? Because John Calvin did. And most people followed Calvin theologically because Calvin was a brilliant systematic theologian. Tyndale didn't. Luther didn't. So, and then they did. So, they, because of that, they didn't believe in purgatory and they didn't believe in the sacraments. Now, the things that they didn't restore was the Sabbath and a clearer view of the great controversy, obviously, and a clearer view of the state of the dead. The other thing that the Reformation planted seeds with but didn't clarify is the idea of religious liberty. Because during this period of time, you couldn't just worship any, any way you wanted. You just did what, your, what, your, what the, the king told you to do. But the Reformation created this idea of religious liberty. You saw this coming up, especially in the Dutch Reformation. I don't have time to go into that, but really they were just seeds. So now the Reformation, you've got uh, also the Wesleys. But now what I want to do is I want to cover a little bit of Adventist history in this portion. So can the last 10, 15 minutes, can somebody read Revelation 12, 17? Okay, so commandments and testimony of Jesus. Okay, so what was Europe like before the rise of the Advent movement? So Europe had gone through the Reformation and Europe was now dying spiritually. And the Wesleys come along and the Wesleys bring great revival 
to the world. Um, and then even in America, you have people like Charles Finney. They're, they're preaching, they're reviving. There's a Methodist movement. What the Wesleys brought, okay, maybe I should do a little bit of a story on the Wesleys. So the Wesleys were an interesting group, right? 19 children were born to Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Three died. They were left with 16. Samuel Wesley was always broke. Not so much because he was like extravagant, but he was just bad with money. So one time, there's a story, one time when he was at Oxford as a student, he was walking along and it was bitterly cold and he saw this young beggar boy and he was under a hedge and his, it was so cold, his clothes had frozen to the ground. And Samuel Wesley comes along and he helps to thaw him. And he take, like Samuel Wesley had all his rent money in his pocket. He takes out his rent money and he gives it to this boy. Now he's completely broke. That was Samuel Wesley. He was always giving his money away on good causes, but not wisely because he was always broke. And so he was, he was a great guy. So he had two sons, he had 16 children, but John Wesley was, is best known. John and Charles Wesley go to Oxford. John goes first, Charles comes later. And then one year, <laughs> um, one year, again, he's broke. Samuel Wesley's broke. And as he famously told John, ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing comes nothing. Meaning I've got no money. There's no, you know, you know. He's like, I'm just stone broke. So he comes home and he tells John, I need you to come home. Because he was, he was a pastor at Epworth and he'd gotten another parish. So he's like, I need you to pastor that church so I can pastor this church so I can have enough income. So John is already like a fellow at Oxford. Uh, but he leaves his job and he goes home. Charles is all alone. Now, Charles was like, he needed his brother to prop him up spiritually. And the thing with the Wesley kids is their mom would like interview, they, there were 16 of them, that they have a spiritual interview once a week. And it wasn't just like any interview. It was like, what is the state of your soul? You know, it was like just this deep interview. And Charles was missing this spiritual interview and missing the oversight of his mother, right? And so he's there and now he's drifting. And he gets in with this wrong crowd of friends and he likes this actress from the theater. And he's like, oh, now he's drifting. And then he suddenly comes to his senses before he drifts too far. And he's like, this is not good. I need some accountability in my life. So he gathers a bunch of his friends in his dorm room at Oxford and they start this little group where they come together to study, to read their Bibles. And they're like, we can't just study and read our Bibles. We need to go share our faith. So they go to the jails, they go to the workhouses, and they're sharing their faith, and they create this little group. And Charles gets this group going. But when his brother John comes back, Charles is like, here, take it. Because Charles was not, Charles was not a leader. Charles was really good at like working, but he was not a leader. And he understood that. So when his brother came back, he's like, here, take it. It's getting too big for me. And under John Wesley, this group, which was called the Holy Club and later the Methodist becomes a movement. And what the Methodist church gives the world, because you've got all of these things happening, is discipleship. The idea of personal, personal spiritual growth and discipleship. Because Luther, Calvin, Tyndale, they all talked about spiritual growth. The Puritans talked about spiritual growth. But it's really the Methodists that brought you to understand that reading your Bible, praying, sharing your faith, these three things really are what help you to grow. So they bring in discipleship and it's spreading all over the world. And during this, into this, this idea, and then so that this is happening. And the other side, what's happening is revolution, right? The American Revolutionary War, uh, the French Revolution, the rise of atheism and the Enlightenment movement. And you've got all these thinkers denouncing the church, denouncing God. So you've got, again, the 